paste the meeting into a list. Arctica twice on meteorite collecting expeditions, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. So moving ahead on the slides here, and I can look at you guys through the camera uh, most of the time, but I do have to divert my attention to the slides, so that's what's happening when I'm looking off to my left here. Uh, here at NASA, we are interested in exploring space, and what that means is usually something like a months long expedition. You're very far from home. The outside environment will kill you if you're not careful. Your living quarters are very cramped. You have a very small group of coworkers from all over the world. And you're isolated from the rest of the world. There's No way to go out and visit your friends when you're on a space expedition. Uh, you also have very little contact with your friends and family. Communication is difficult between Earth and space. Finally, you're out in space. Uh, you're working very long days. Basic facts of life like eating and drinking are difficult. And by the way, so is going to the bathroom. So at NASA, we're working very hard on getting people ready for expeditions to Mars. You can see the picture of the planet there. Someday we'll be going there on an expedition like that. Today, we're sending our astronauts to here, the International Space Station, for an expedition like the one I described. But interestingly enough, right here on Earth, you can get an experience very much like that here in Antarctica. Um, so this talk is about the experiences that I had on the Antarctic Search for Meteorites, or ANSMET. This is an expedition that goes down to Antarctica every year with a team of between uh, six and 12 people and spends two months out on the ice cap searching for meteorites. So why go to Antarctica to collect meteorites? After all, meteorites fall everywhere on Earth just the same as many land in America as land in Europe as land in Russia as land in Antarctica. They're, they're, meteorites fall the same everywhere. Why go to Antarctica? Well, there's three main reasons you want to do that. Um, first of all, most of the places on Earth, uh, at least those that aren't covered with water, of course, a meteorite falls in the ocean. We're not going to find that one. But one that falls on land is immediately mixed up with all kinds of earth rocks and dirt. And it can be very hard to tell which rock in a field full of rocks uh, came from space and which one is just a plain old earth rock that's not very interesting. Down in Antarctica, most of the surface is covered with snow and ice. And a rock sitting on top of that snow and ice can only have come from outer space. The nearest earth rocks are two miles below your feet, you know, underneath all that snow and ice. Another thing about meteorites is that many of them have been out in space for four and a half billions of year, billion years in a very dry environment. Once meteorites fall on Earth and get in the moisture of Earth with rain falling on them, uh, and that moist environment actually starts changing the chemistry of the rocks. Uh, there's a lot of iron in there that actually just rusts away. And a meteorite doesn't really last all that long in geological terms once it lands on the surface of the Earth. Down in Antarctica, very cold, all that liquid water is frozen, and so the moist environment doesn't make the rock degrade, and rock, a rock that fell 200,000 years ago looked like it might have fallen out of the sky just yesterday. Finally, although meteorites fall all over Antarctica, the ice in Antarctica is always on the move. It's always piling up from a very thin uh, snowfall of just tiny little crystals, almost too small to see, that uh, precipitates down on the top of the continent near the South Pole. And then as that piles up, the weight of that ice starts shifting it, and it's gradually flowing off towards the edges of the continent, where it then uh, drifts off into the sea as ice. But there are some places where a buried mountain range will stop the flow of that ice. And in those places, the only thing that can make the ice disappear then, instead of flowing off the, to the sea, is the wind. The wind is always blowing in Antarctica, and sometimes it's blowing really hard. And it actually blows the ice away, gradually evaporates the ice. And in places where that happens, when the ice evaporates, it leaves the rocks behind. So in these places, which are marked by blue ice, I'll show you a picture of it later, but in an aerial photo, it really looks like uh, light, pale blue ice, sort of sky colored. Um, there's areas where um, the meteorites that fell on a huge area of Antarctica all get concentrated together and then the wind blows away the ice, leaving the rocks behind. And since the rocks are concentrated, it's easier to find them. So that's why we go to uh, Antarctica to look for meteorites. So um, with that in mind, we'll come to our first question, which is what challenges or concerns 
would you might, might you have faced during a month-long expedition to Antarctica or to space? Go ahead and write your answers in the chat window. So think about that, discuss it as a class, and we'll start seeing what you have to say about this. So the Rice School is saying enough food, and, and you can't hear it here because I just had us muted, but uh, that caused a little giggle over here. That's a good answer. Very harsh climate from Ms. Woodfin in the Rice School. Smith Elementary is saying being away from family and the living challenges are some of the things that they identify uh, in their in Del Delaware. They're wondering about if you would freeze hypothermia from Pine Lane and the lack of food. Cedar Ridge is thinking about the failure of instruments and unforeseen issues that might occur. Wilkinson Intermediate saying in space, the concern is about your muscles and bones. Uh, Rice School also mentions frostbite. This seems to be a common theme. Even our Scottsdale group, uh, Anasazi, says frostbite and not enough food. And also health concerns, food supply, living environment, disease, socialization, oxygen, changes to your body, the weather, no showers. Oh my goodness, that is an interesting one to have there. And that last one came in there from Smith Elementary. So Sam, what do you think of some of those answers? Uh, all good ones. Um, the wind is a concern. It doesn't actually blow things away. No showers is a biggie. You can take a sponge bath, um, which means you heat up some water in a little basin on your camp stove and uh, you're in a tent with a tent mate, you have your tent mate go for a walk or turn the other way and you just sort of sponge off one part of your body at the time. You don't want to strip down completely because it's still pretty cold in the tent. Um, food is huge, I'm gonna talk about that later. Uh, food is absolutely critical. The good news is there's plenty of it. Um, isolation from friends and family is a big deal. Uh, we can send from the field camp uh, text messages of 120 characters via a satellite telephone uh, so our, our uh, friends and relatives in the United States can send us those messages. We can't send them back. But we can call on the SAP phone, um, usually for a few minutes every few days to speak to friends and family. Um, separation from the group, not an issue. Um, we have a very strict rule in ANSMET, which is no one in Antarctica is alone. So if somebody goes for a walk, somebody else goes with them. If somebody has to stay in camp because they're not feeling well that day, somebody stays in camp with them. Um, so we are very, very careful about that. We do not want anybody wandering off by themselves. Uh, frostbite and hypothermia are also concerns, especially frostbite. Hypothermia uh, tends to be a worse concern when it's not that cold, but when it's wet. If you get wet clothes next to your body in, say, 50 degree weather, you're in big trouble. Uh, at uh, 40 degrees below zero, uh, nothing's gonna be wet but uh, you do have to make sure you're wearing enough clothes. But in those conditions, an exposed part of your face or your hands can get frostbitten pretty easily. Um, you have to be very careful to keep yourself covered up. Um, all really good uh, concerns. Uh, yeah, wind is big. Um, wind sort of controls how much work we do if the wind is 10 knots, so 12 miles an hour. That's a great day in Antarctica. You can be out all day in that looking for meteorites and you come back and you feel pretty good. 20 knots, the wind chill's starting to pick up. You can kind of be out there for maybe half the day and then everyone's getting pretty cold and they want to go back to camp and get a hot lunch and then maybe go out again for a couple more hours. But you really don't want to spend all day out in that. 30 knots, you're staying in the tent. Uh, and the tent is shaking and rattling. You can, you know, have to wear earplugs because it's loud. It's very tough to sleep under those conditions. Outside, the wind has picked up the snow. The snow is uh, blowing all over camp. It is drifting up your supplies that you have stacked up outside. So you have to go and dig them out once the wind stops. And once the snow starts moving across the surface of the ice, you can't see any meteorites anymore because they're obscured by drifting snow. And uh, so it's not a good day to work. So for those of you in Arizona, you probably have no idea what it is like to experience these types of uh, temperatures, but our Colorado group perhaps, but uh, great input and great uh, stories here from, uh, from Stan on this. So let's see what else you got for us, Stan. All right, let's move on then. All right, um, so any expedition to space starts with, uh, with a launch, leaving uh, the civilized parts of Earth and heading for parts unknown. Uh, so that's what I'm gonna talk about next. 
So uh, for a person living in Houston, if you are joining ANSMET for an expedition that year, and remember, we go to Antarctica in the summer, that's the southern summer, so that's the months of December and January. When it's winter in the northern hemisphere, it's summer in the southern hemisphere. By the way, if you guys want to be smarter than a graduate of Harvard University, all you have to know is that fact. We asked a bunch of Harvard graduates uh, why it's warm in the summer and cold in the winter, and they said, oh, the Earth is slightly closer to the sun in summer. And you say, well, you know what? Perihelion of the Earth and its orbit is in January. How do you explain that? Uh, so anyway, it's the Earth's axial tilt, and that's why the seasons are reversed in the northern and southern hemisphere. So northern winter, southern summers when you go to Antarctica. Um, I took a commercial flight from uh, near my home here in Houston up to Dallas, another commercial plane to Los Angeles, then a long hop across the Pacific Ocean to Sydney, Australia, where we took yet another plane to Christchurch, New Zealand. And Christchurch is an interesting town. Uh, not only is it where the United States Antarctic Program keeps its main depot of supplies, and that's where all the aircraft that go down to the main base in Antarctica uh, leave from, from civilization, but it's also the place where Captain Robert Falcon Scott and Captain Shackleton and all the famous Antarctic explorers of the last century and the century before, it was also their jumping off point too. So if you ever have a chance to read about Antarctic exploration, you'll uh, read that those guys generally uh, um, had their ships in Christchurch before they set off for the uh, Southern Pole. You go to Christchurch for one main reason, and it's to go to this building. This is called the Clothing Distribution Center, and it's where everybody who's going to go to Antarctica goes to get their cold weather gear. So you don't have to have your own parka that's good down to minus 40 or your own boots that are good down to minus 40. Uh, the U.S. government will loan you these things. So you come to the Clothing Distribution Center. You've sent them paperwork a long time ago that told them what size you were, and they picked out all the gear for you and put it in these two big, ugly, orange duffel bags. So you walk in. They check your name off the list, they hand you these duffel bags, and then it's your job to go in there and try everything on and make sure that it fits you and make sure that it's in good condition. If you get out to field camp and you find out that your underwear doesn't fit, you are just going to have underwear that doesn't fit because it's really hard to get a replacement pair out to you when you're 300 miles from the nearest outpost. So you go through and make sure that everything that it should be in your bag is in your bag, and you try everything on to make sure it fits. Then you're ready to head south. It takes about one day to uh, do your work at the clothing distribution center. Usually the next day, uh, they schedule you for a flight down to Antarctica. Now, every day is not a good weather day in Antarctica. Often the weather is so bad that the aircraft can't fly. Sometimes an airplane will get halfway down there and then either uh, experience a mechanical problem or the weather will get bad and they'll have to turn around and what we call boomerang back to Christchurch, and then you go and hang around in Christchurch until your next opportunity to fly. Um, sometimes that can be days, which is okay because Christchurch is a very pretty city and there's a lot of fun stuff to do around there. But on the day that you go to fly, um, you come here. This is the Antarctic Terminal, which is a building that's located on the Christchurch International Airport, but not in the same, as the, uh, same building as the normal passenger terminal and you wait for your flight. You can see everybody has their big coats out here and their orange duffel bags. You actually have to be wearing your big red parka, your big black snow pants, and your big white uh, rubber boots. Um, these boots are actually built with two walls and a dead airspace in between for insulation, uh, so they keep your feet warm no matter how cold it gets. They're really awesome, but they don't, have, they don't breathe very well because they're all rubber. Uh, so that means at the end of the day, your feet have been stewing in their own juices all day, and it's really, really important to hang your socks up to dry every night or you're going to regret it. And by the way, for a six-week field season, they give you four pairs of socks. Just let that sink in for a minute. So really important to take good care of your socks. Um, interestingly enough, that object you see hanging on the wall in the back, and I think I have a little red dot I can move there, this thing here, that is called a Nansen Sled, named after Fridtjof Nansen, who was a Norwegian explorer of the Arctic in the late 1800s. And he designed this sledge specifically to be drawn by dogs to carry cargo across snow and ice. We are still using those sleds today, although we're pulling them with snowmobiles, not dogs anymore. Um, but the design was so good 
Uh, it is flexible, so it can, it can twist as it goes over lumps in the ice and not fall apart. Uh, it can carry hundreds of pounds of cargo, and it's just such a wonderful design that we're still using it today. This is your ride from Christchurch to Antarctica. Uh, this is a U.S. Air Force C-17 cargo plane. Um, this particular one is run by a squadron that's based up in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, during most parts of the year, they're uh, running missions for the United States Air Force, but in, uh, during the Antarctic field season, um, the National Science Foundation uh, gets the services of one C-17 to shuffle, uh, shuffle people and cargo back and forth between Christchurch and McMurdo Station. And the military pilots, by the way, they make patches for each mission, and the one my year had a picture of the Grinch that said uh, Christmas is canceled because, of course, they're flying these missions during the winter holidays, summer in the south, but uh, during Christmas time, these guys are down there busily shuttling back and forth between New Zealand and Antarctica, and they don't get to have the holidays with their family. This is what that airplane looks like inside. So mostly it's cargo, big piles of stuff strapped down with chains so the cargo doesn't shift when the airplane uh, jiggles around or changes its orientation. Um, and then there's a row of seats along each side, and that, those are designed for paratroopers, so they are a aluminum rod with some webbing slung over it, and so they're not super comfortable. You're going to sit there for five hours, and by the way, this is the luxury plane. The difficult plane is the C-130 cargo plane, where they line up the passengers so close, you're sitting across from each other, and you have to interleave your knees together because there's not enough room for two people to sit and not have their knees bang. Um, so this one you could stretch out. It was a really good deal. All sorts of interesting cargo rides with you to Antarctica. There's a big tank of liquid oxygen. Not sure what they're using that for. This is a spare propeller for a C-130 cargo plane. Uh, once in a while, one of those C-130s, uh, when it's taxiing on the ground, will turn too sharp and the prop will hit the snow, and that's it for that propeller. So they have to take off that propeller and put on a new one. So they brought a spare down there in case that happened. It takes about five hours to fly from Christchurch to McMurdo. Most of that time you're over ocean, and so it's not very interesting. Uh, one nice thing, though, is that since you're not in the U.S. air travel system anymore, you're on a military plane, they uh, actually open up the cockpit to passengers so one or two people at a time can come up and look out the front windows. So if you've never had a chance to look out the window of a jet plane, this is your opportunity. And after about uh, three hours of flying, this is what you see out the window. This is Victoria Land, the part of the coast of, uh, of Antarctica that you fly along once you reach the continent before you get to McMurdo. And I like to say uh, you don't need very many crayons to draw Antarctica. You need a blue one, you need a white one, you need a black one. That's all you need. Another view of Victoria Land underneath the wing of the plane. In the center is a huge glacier. This is one of the many glaciers that drains all that ice off the center of the continent as it flows down to the ocean. And then you land and you get off the plane. Of course, uh, it's a nice day. Uh, there's blinding sun. We are well below the Antarctic Circle and we are in the height of summer. That means the sun never sets. It just cranks around the horizon once every 24 hours but it never goes up and down and you're in, uh, in, your, in full daylight the whole time. Some people get down there and they get what they call big eye. They forget to go to sleep. They're gonna go to the coffee shop and then uh, let's go uh, for a hike and then let's go see down to the shore and see if we can see any penguins and then uh, let's go to the Kiwi Ski Hill and, and go on the tow rope and, and they just forget to sleep for about 36 hours and then they kind of fall over. But you can get that way if you're not used to the 24 hour daylight. So getting off the plane, uh, first thing that happens is you step out onto the ice. By the way, the runway there in, uh, in near McMurdo is built on sea ice that's uh, many feet thick, but underneath that is 4,000 feet deep water. So you're on sea ice when you land, and about and they want march you over to Ivan the Terra bus here, which is this gigantic uh, bus with big balloon tires about six feet in diameter. That's the taxi they use for hauling lots of people from the airport over to McMurdo proper. And this other thing over here, the mountain here, that's Mount Erebus, 13,000 foot tall volcano. It's one of the most active volcanoes on Earth. And if you look very carefully, you can see the plume of vapor coming out the summit of that mountain. And that's like the first thing you see when you step off the plane. It's really incredible. 
All right, um, next thing I'm gonna talk about is McMurdo Station proper, but before that, let's do another question. Uh, what aspects might, might need to be in place before we can have explorers living and working on Mars? So now as you think about this, you've been hearing about Antarctica, so sort of switch gears in this other extreme environment like Mars, and what types of things might we need to really have in place before these explorers can live and work there? And we'll see what you come up with. Water and oxygen. Oxygen first, by the way. You live for three minutes without oxygen. You can get by for about three days without water. And they're also saying seeds, temperature control, shelter, yeah. showers. Yeah, showers. we would hope so. <laughs> Transportation, uh, also coming from the Rice School here in um, Texas, as well as electricity. Uh, and so some of these things I would imagine are challenging to have in Antarctica, let alone on Mars. They also are talking about atmosphere, food, water, shelter. Cedar Ridge is mentioning about a more controlled atmosphere. Pine Lane Elementary mentions long distance spacecraft, shelter, non-perishable food. Uh, and even Rice School is mentioning the whole idea of pets. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Though you may have comfort with your pets, uh, having them... Uh... No, life support for pets is hard. Man, it's hard to get fresh kitty litter on Mars. <laughs> now, Anasazi in Arizona says, air and good soil, buildings, habitats, water, good environment, ways to create agriculture, innovative spacesuits. And they also continue with clothing that can withstand the elements, medication, and even Smith uh, Elementary mentions a way to get back off of Mars. Also very important. And how to adapt to gravitational differences comes from Cedar Ridge, as well as, again, good clothing and medicine from Wilkerson. Yeah. Well, adapting to gravity is worth, uh, worth talking about a little bit. Um, I had the good fortune uh, to come into the astronaut office when John Young, who was the commander of Apollo 16, uh, was still in the astronaut office. And I had a chance to fly with him in the trainer jet a lot. And he said something interesting. He says, I've been in 1G, normal Earth gravity. I've been in 0G, floating in space. And I've been on the moon. And the moon is far and away the most comfortable of those three. So even though we all grew up in 1G, uh, and we know it's a little hard to adapt to 0G, interestingly enough, he found the one-sixth gravity of the moon to be more comfortable than either one of those. Very interesting. Well, you know, and the last thing that the Rice School mentions is um, Wi-Fi, and Hillcrest even mentions this whole idea of if you need to separate yourself, whether you're having issues with yeah. uh, other Time people. Yeah, room, that's a oh, good one. <laughs> exactly, that is a good one. So we hope we would not need a timeout room. Actually, in the astronaut corps, one of the first things you do if you get hired is you spend a lot of time uh, learning about how to get along with people, even if you don't like them that well. Um, they also send you out for wilderness, uh, expeditions uh, with an outfit called the National Outdoor Leadership School, and the whole point of that is to get used to being away from home, uncomfortable, dirty, cold, hungry, tired, and still be super nice to everybody. Um, so that is a skill. When we send people to Mars, that's the first skill we're going to look for. People need to have super good interpersonal skills and to be able to still be polite and nice and, then most of all, thoughtful of others even under conditions when it's so cold or, or windy or you're so tired that you can think about only yourself. That's when it's most important to think about your teammates. And then teamwork is a very important aspect in any line of work. So working together is, is and teamwork is important. Yeah. Here's just one other thing before we go back to Antarctica. Speaking of meteorites, what would you do if a meteorite crashed into, like, your Mars habitat? Could that even be a possibility of happening? Are there meteorites even on Mars? That, well, yeah, the Mars rovers have come across a number of meteorites just sitting out there on the sand and taking pictures of them, and everybody got real excited. But meteorites don't hit Mars any more often than they hit the Earth. Um, so if you're worried about meteorites crashing into your habitat on Mars, you should be similarly worried about what would happen if a meteorite hit your house. And I don't know anybody who worries about that. It's not in my homeowner's insurance. It's probably not in yours. <laughs> Good answer. So let's go back to Antarctica now. Sure. Okay. So the uh, the outpost on in Antarctica that you go to is called McMurdo Station. This is the largest settlement in Antarctica. In the summer, there are about a thousand people that live and work here, um, mostly support workers. 
There's about 200 scientists at most, um, but there are maybe another 800 people who cook the food, wash the dishes, move the cargo, drive the trucks, make sure that the sewage plant still works. Uh, we had the sewage plant go down while I was there, and let me tell you, that's a really bad day in a space settlement. And they say, all right, we got exactly two flushes left in the bathroom. Use them wisely. Uh, so that's kind of a problem. Um, so there's, it takes a lot of support workers to keep this little city functioning for the small number of scientists that are down there uh, learning about how the world works. Uh, in the winter, when no ships can come in or out, and it's dark 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the, it's too cold for the airplanes to fly down there, plus they really don't like, like landing on ice in the dark, um, the population of McMurdo is about 150, very brave people who stay over the winter. Um, actually, there's an interesting movie called Antarctica, A Year on Ice, which an uh, uh, amateur photographer shot using his own cameras, um, and he talks about spending a full year in McMurdo. I highly recommend the movie. It has some beautiful time-lapse photography of what it's like down there, and it gives a good idea of the experience of being there. So um, I took a lot of uh, engineering data to share with the engineers here at NASA. I won't uh, talk about this too much. One interesting thing, for that city of 1,000 people, it takes about 1,000, uh, pardon me, 1.7 megawatts of electrical power. 90% of that comes from diesel generators. The other 10% comes from three wind turbines that they have set up on the ridge line. They're ordering more wind turbines because they don't want to keep shipping diesel down here to run the electrical generators. But um, uh, makers of electric turbines, wind turbines, don't make them small enough anymore. Uh, you have to have a small wind turbine in Antarctica because a big one will get pushed over by the wind. Uh, so it's been difficult to find a supplier who will provide wind turbines that are small enough for use at McMurdo. Here's another shot of Ivan the Terabus. Uh, all the big vehicles down there have names for some reason. I'm not quite sure why, but it's fun. Here's a Ford pickup truck with a, a box bed and treads instead of wheels for driving on snow and ice. This object is called the Cress. I never saw them use this, but it's way bigger than item the Terabus. The passenger compartment in the back here probably seats 100, 120 people, and these tires are eight feet in diameter. This is the main building in McMurdo, uh, Building 151. It's got the cafeteria and the main dormitory. And in the winter, when it's real cold and hard to go between buildings, most of the folks live there in, uh, in Building 151. And you can see a couple of the passenger vans they use for shuttling people around McMurdo. And also, uh, about a mile and a half down the road, to Scott Base, which is the New Zealand Antarctica main base in Antarctica. They have about 50 people there, um, almost all men, so they're always throwing parties to try to get some uh, American girls to come over. This is one of the dormitories, very no-nonsense building. You're not going to live in a beautiful house if you go to Antarctica. Um, it's up on blocks. So the wind can blow freely underneath it. That helps prevent snow from accumulating around it. If you make a building that touches down to the ground, snow tends to pile up around it, whereas if you leave a little airspace, the snow will just drift underneath it and won't pile up. My favorite building in McMurdo, this is the coffee shop. A um, couple of Quonset huts. It looks kind of grim from the outside. Uh, this is the doorway. It's an airlock, like most doors in Antarctica. Uh, there's an outer door, then a little room to keep the climate controlled, and then the inside. Um, but they offer, like, free coffee and free hot chocolate, which is nice. Um, in this section, they show movies, and they do, like, bad poetry night and things like that. People come and read their poetry. This is the chapel. They have an interfaith chapel down there. Uh, you notice it's got anchors in front of it. McMurdo was actually founded by the United States Navy back in 1956 in preparation for the International Geophysical Year when uh, America really started its, its big involvement down in Antarctica. Um, and there's little Navy things all around town. For instance, the dining hall at McMurdo is called the galley, which is what you call the, the dining room on a ship. The gift shop is called the ship's store, even though it's firmly on land. Um, and there's little things in the, a couple of the pubs. They have uh, uh, some mementos from the Seabees, which is the Navy Construction Battalion, the, the Navy Civil Engineering Group, um, that helped build McMurdo back in the 1950s. 
This is a bigger view of, of McMurdo Station, and I want you to look carefully at this. Um, down here where I'm pointing the pointer, this is where all the people are. This is the dormitory, this is the dining hall, this is the laboratory, this is the uh, small machine shop, heavy machine shop, and this is where they store all the field equipment and a couple more dormitories. And the physical plant that supplies the electricity, the fresh water, and handles the sewage is down here. That little area is where the people live. All of the rest of this stuff, about three quarters of the area of McMurdo, is storage. Big tanks for storing diesel, for storing um, motor gas for the motor vehicles. Um, huge lines of pallets of cargo getting ready to go on an airplane to go down to the South Pole Station. Um, all the stuff that's going to sustain McMurdo Station for the one-year gaps between when the ship comes at the end of summer. and One ship comes in, they load off all the good stuff, they load a bunch of garbage onto the ship and take it away. And once a year you get to uh, exchange materials. And storing all the materials to run a city for a year takes three times as much room as the city itself. An interesting thing to think about. And also very important when we start uh, designing space colonies. You have to make sure you have enough room for all the stuff. On Space Station right now, we don't have room for all the stuff. We didn't plan enough storage closets. It's all full of laboratories. Closer look at some of the uh, stuff getting ready to go out uh, or um, in storage for McMurdo. And throwing something in the trash in McMurdo is a big deal. They take recycling very seriously down there. They don't want to pollute Antarctica, so all trash must go back to the United States on a ship. We don't throw anything away into the environment in Antarctica. Um, so there are about 12 different recycle bins that you have to deal with when you want to throw something away. You can see up in the front here, this one says non-recyclables. You might think, ah, I'll just throw everything in non-recyclable. But if somebody catches you doing that, you're going to get in trouble. Um, my favorite is actually SCUA. Uh, SCUA is a southern hemisphere seagull that's like five times stronger than a normal seagull and has a bad attitude. They will like attack you to get a french fry if you go outside with a french fry. Um, but SCUA here means uh, stuff I don't need anymore that might possibly be useful to somebody that I can just give away. So you put it in SCUA um, and then people can go to a little building called SCUA Central and if you need a towel, I got down there and my, my high-tech camping towel turned out to be absolutely useless. So I needed a terry cloth, proper terry cloth towel. I went to SCUA Central and I found a towel that had been somebody's sewing project. They'd like sewed a couple of little crooked denim fish on it or something like that, but it was still a good towel. So school is a good deal. It allows you to get stuff that you forgot to bring. <laughs> uh, there are signs like this all over McMurdo. Uh, conserve hot water, conserve electricity. Every um, ounce of fresh water that is used in McMurdo has to be desalinated from seawater, and that takes a lot of electrical power and a lot of diesel fuel. It's supposed to cost $20 to flush the toilet in McMurdo. That's just for the fuel to desalinate the water. You flush the toilet at the South Pole Station, it costs 50 bucks, and that's for the fuel to, tra to transport the fuel to the South Pole to melt the ice that's going to go into your toilet flush. So there's a lot of reminders to be conservative with your resources. That's absolutely going to be what it's like in space. Everybody who goes to the dining hall in Antarctica, and that means everybody, has to walk past this little display three times a day or six times a day, going in and coming out, and it tells, it tells you how much electricity McMurdo is using and how much it's costing the U.S. taxpayers. How would you like to get a $6,700 a day electrical bill? Big deal. And most of the cost of that is shipping diesel fuel in a ship to Antarctica that then gets burned in the generators to make the electricity. This is a dorm room in McMurdo, very tight quarters for three people. You gotta kinda hope your roommate doesn't snore. And this is a sign outside the housing office. Uh, little fun facts for McMurdo, there were 942 people living in McMurdo that week with, you know, with planes coming and going, the population's always changing. Uh, Male-female ratio, 75 to 25. Um, I've heard it said, ladies, that bringing a boyfriend to Antarctica is like bringing a sandwich to a smorgasbord. Enough said about that. And these are all the activities that go on each day of the week in McMurdo. Um, one of the things I like about McMurdo is that anybody who has a skill or a hobby loves to share it with everybody else. So we got down there in my last group, 
and they had a swing dancing class in one of the gyms. So yeah, let's go learn how to swing dance. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but there's all sorts of exercise classes, movies, uh, poetry, um, people sharing their interests because the community is so small, you don't have, you know, you never know what you're going to get. So I talked about the cost of shipping all that diesel fuel down to Antarctica. It turns out that uh, in the 1960s and 70s, they didn't have to do that because they were running McMurdo off of a nuclear power plant. Uh, it was a specially designed one, one that could fit into 35,000 pound shipping containers and be brought down in sections in C-130 cargo planes. Um, and they set that thing up and they got all the power they wanted and they didn't have to ship any diesel fuel. Unfortunately, it leaked like a sieve and it poured radioactive water over the decade that it was running down into the rocks underneath it. And those are porous rocks, so the water seeped in there. And they ended up at great expense after they decommissioned the power plant having to excavate all that rock and ship it back to the United States to be disposed of as nuclear waste. So in the long run, they decided it's better to just pay for the diesel than have to pay for a cleanup like that. Here's another view of McMurdo Station uh, from a different vantage point, and I want to draw your attention to this little building here. Here's a close-up of it. This is one of Captain Robert Falcon Scott's exploration huts that they, his team used as a sort of advance base uh, when they made their famous trip to the South Pole in 1912, uh, from which they did not return. Uh, the Norwegians, actually, the Norwegian team that was racing them to the pole beat them by about a month. The Norwegians got back okay, uh, but the uh, English team did not. They perished out on the Ross Ice Shelf uh, about 11 miles from their next food depot, um, but they couldn't reach it because it had gotten into March and the weather was too bad. But his exploration hut is still there. It's a historical artifact. This is what it looks like underneath the sunshade. Um, this object here is a dead seal that Captain Scott's guys killed over 100 years ago and just left. They hadn't gotten to eat it yet, and they left, and they left the seal, and it is still there. This is what it looks like inside. A lot of the original materials that the explorers used during their Antarctic trip. And this is some of their cold weather gear. And this is one of the reasons they died like flies, okay? Today we have uh, big puffy down parkas and two layer rubber boots and synthetic pile and waterproof fabrics that still breathe. Um, these guys were using wool and canvas. All right, so after our time in McMurdo, uh, we spent about 10 days there getting all our equipment ready, getting trained on how to use it. And then we hopped in the plane to fly out to our work site to go look for meteorites. This is our ride. I've talked about the C-130 cargo plane. This is it. Medium-sized plane. can carry about 20,000 pounds of payload, four big propellers. And you may recognize those propellers from uh, the one we saw in cargo in the C-17. Uh, it's not as fast, and it's really loud. Uh, seasoned Antarctic travelers, when they go on the C-130, they put in little foam earplugs, and then they put big earmuffs over that just to try to keep the noise down. This is what our gear looked like in the back of the C-130. And we took off out of McMurdo, and this is the scenery we saw looking out the window, mountains and clouds. Then the aircraft drops us off. Uh, they roll all of our cargo out on pallets out the back of the aircraft. Uh, we make sure that we have a tent up. We make radio or satellite phone contact with McMurdo and have a stove running. And the aircraft waits with its engines running until we do all three of those things. They will not leave until we've shown them that. Uh, so when we are uh, ready for the plane to go, they take off. You can see them doing their takeoff run here. They fire the jet-assisted takeoff bottles to give them a little extra oomph. And away they go. And then it gets very quiet. And you're out there with your teammates in the wilds of Antarctica, and the airplane has left. So, with that in mind, uh, what might go through your mind if you were a crew member who had just arrived to begin your exploration of Mars? So think about that and let's see what kind of answers you come up with in the chat window. The cold of Antarctica versus the cold of Mars and what are you going to be thinking about? So right away the Rice School says, I'd want to explore. 
That's a true explorer, huh? I'd want to have dinner. <laughs> Oxier says, "How wondering how they're going to get back. Good they're question. Going to You'd want to have a firm plan in place even before you got down on the surface. And Wilkerson says they feel that, that would be, they'd be afraid in a certain uh, extent. But, honesty is good. Yes. Uh, Cedar Ridge might be wondering where, where's the restroom. Oh, you'll set the restroom up when you get there. <laughs> and uh, Oxier also mentions they'd be thinking about what you might find and how uncomfortable the extreme quiet may be. Also, Anasazi in the fifth grade group says, uh, where's the safest place to camp? Why did I come here? Are they sending more people? And someone else is even mentoring, could you sell the rocks? But also Santana and the Rice School says they're wondering about, will there be life already or even a whole lot of excitement from Wilkerson Intermediate? Yep, all good things. Will there be life there already? We're pretty sure if there is any life on Mars, it's A, underground, and B, microbes. There's not going to be much life there. In Antarctica, it, at our field site, we were far from the coast. It was very cold, and I like to joke, it was just us and our gut flora. We saw no other living thing of any kind. Even around McMurdo, you see sea life, penguins and seals. Um, but on land, the only life you see is some little lichen, like moss-like things in a couple of spots on the rocks, but most of it is just completely barren. Yeah, and that barrenness is what could make you feel a little nervous, according to some of these groups here. Now, Evergreen also mentions they'd be wondering about where should I start exploring first. They might be a little nervous. Where's the restroom? Where will we live? Hillcrest, perhaps pertaining to the, uh, the Martian movie, where do we plant potatoes? Uh, and then- Indoors, don't plant them outdoors. No they outdoor they potatoes? Well. Oh, that's good to know. Uh, how will the gravity feel? And even will there be storms? And both Oxier and Cedar Ridge are wondering, would you know if a storm's coming? Oh, how do you deal with the that? Martian. Okay, they, let's but talk you gotta about... deal with that in the Mars or Antarctica. But yeah, let's talk about, about the Mars dust storm. So Mars does have these dust storms and they can grow to encompass the entire planet. Um, but even though the wind speeds are high enough to raise dust, Mars's atmosphere is less than 1% as thick as the Earth's atmosphere, which means that even though the wind air may be moving, it doesn't pack a punch. So one of the very few technical things they got wrong in The Martian, and they got like 95% of things right in that movie. It was awesome. I loved it. Uh, but that was one of them. It's not going to be picking up pebbles and throwing them against the wall and shaking the habitat that bad. So if... So if the, the wind wouldn't pack a punch on Mars, let's get back to Antarctica. Oh, the pack wind absolutely a packs Mars. a punch in Antarctica. Oh, my God. So, yeah, it, uh, 30 knot winds are going to shake the tent so loud that you can barely hear your tent mate talking. Um, and in the winter, the wind can be 80 knots or 100 knots, you know, hurricane force winds for weeks on end. Uh, it's, it's a really bad scene when the wind's blowing strong. Wow. Well, let's take us back to Antarctica, Stan. Okay. Um, for a second. As we continue on, we're going to see how far we can get into some more details about Antarctica. Okay. So after the airplane leaves, you set up your home. This is our field camp uh, with our tents and our snowmobiles and the beautiful Antarctic scenery in the background. This is our living quarters. It's called a Scott tent after Captain Scott who invented it. It's uh, a, built like a pyramid with four big aluminum poles and an outer canvas wall and an inver inner canvas wall. The tent stakes are sections of uh, plumbing pipe, one inch in diameter, with a piece of reinforcing bars welded across the top. The tent guy lines that hold the tent up are as thick as your finger, not a normal camping tent. The tent weighs about 80 pounds, and it holds two people. They are supposed to be able to withstand winds of, of 90 miles an hour. Here's what it looks like inside. This is my uh, tent mate, Rob Coker, hanging out on his sleeping pad. Uh, there's enough room. It's about an eight-foot square for one person's bed, and then the stoves and a couple of boxes with food and equipment, and then the other person's bed. And it has a cheerful yellow color inside. It's also ventilated so that you can run a camp stove inside the tent. Unless your tent is designed for this, do not run a camp stove in the tent. You will die of carbon monoxide poisoning. So don't try this at home, kids, unless you've got a properly designed tent. Um, actually, the guy who invented continental drift, a guy named Alfred Wegener, uh, died in his tent in Greenland because he was running a stove in an improperly ventilated tent. 
Uh, details on the stove is just a standard camp stove, except ours burn propane, which is much easier to deal with than liquid fuels. If you spill liquid gasoline or stove, stove fuel on your hand and it's minus 40 degrees, you will get frostbite instantly. So we are really happy not to have to use liquid fuel anymore. The propane thing, you just hook up, the, hook up the tube, strike a match, and you're good, and you can't spill it on you. So every Antarctic tent has this chandelier hanging from the top. With the stove running in the tent, uh, down at floor level, the temperature is about freezing. Up at about chest level, where if you're sitting on your sleeping bag, you know, or your head and chest are, it's about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And up in the top, it's like 85. But you can't stand there because it's a pyramid, and right over the, right under the middle of the tent is the stove, and you can't stand on the stove. But this is where you hang your boots and gloves and hats and mufflers and socks, especially socks. Remember what I told you about the socks. Um, so that they can dry out. And you really want to keep those things warm and dry in between when you're using them because if you don't, uh, next time you put them on, they're going to be smelly, they're going to be full of water, and you're going to be an unhappy camper. In fact, I know a person who went to Antarctica uh, on her second trip because of a lesson learned on the first one. She couldn't get her socks quite dry, so she brought a fresh pair of wool socks for every day she was going to be in the field. 42 pairs of wool socks just so that she could put on clean, dry socks every day. This is what your food looks like. Um, we can have frozen food, obviously. Temperature is always below freezing, and there's no bears that are going to get into it or bugs. Um, you just leave it outside. So we have dry goods, and we have frozen food. Uh, fresh vegetables, not so much. It would be great to, to have a fresh apple. In fact, on one of our resupply flights, they brought us a, uh, three little golf ball-sized fresh apples, uh, which we shared among eight people, and after a month in the field, it's like the best apple you ever ate. But that's what our food supply looks like, just lined up outside the tent. Uh, and for two people for six weeks, that's about 180 pounds of food, and it occupies about half a cubic meter. This is our water supply. We are standing on water. We are driving around on water. We are camping on water. You just go out there with your geologic hammer, bash up, open some uh, blue ice here. Snow, of course, if you get a bucket full of snow, it melts down to a little puddle of water. You melt down ice, you get a bigger puddle of water. So ice is what you bring in in the bucket, put it on the stove, and that's where your water supply comes from. We take about uh, three liters per person per day. Uh, you want to stay well hydrated in the cold, even though you don't feel uh, as thirsty as you do if you're in hot climate, you need to keep yourself hydrated to be healthy. Uh, and then the rarely broached topic of the potty. This is the potty. It's a gray bucket like this one, only facing up. It's got a plastic bag for a liner. You have a styrofoam seat, super important. If you brought a normal toilet seat down there and sat on it, it's about 20 below zero. You might stay sitting there for a long time because you'd freeze to it, and that would be really, really uncomfortable. The styrofoam, however, warms up to your body temperature immediately when you sit on it, and so that's nice. When one of these buckets is full, we use a mallet to pound the lid on it, and then they take it away in the airplane, and we're very grateful for that when the airplane comes. This is our electric power couple of solar panels with a couple of uh, low temperature car batteries inside, and that gives us about 35 watts of power. It's enough to run a laptop uh, or recharge a couple of iPods. Not really very much, but it's really all we needed in camp. So we had barely any electrical power, but we had as much as we needed. That's our communication. That's an Iridium satellite telephone. Uh, this will work even when you have no bars for your cell phone. I know that's a situation of horror for most young folks these days. Um, but you do have the Iridium phone, and that uses satellite. Get the engineering data. This is our transportation. It's a standard, off-the-shelf, uh, Canadian-made snowmobile. And we live and work on these things. Uh, that's how we move our camp from place to place. That's how we get around to find the meteorites. And every day we spend some time with care and feeding of our snowmobiles. We make sure they're covered up when we're not using them. Um, I'd also like to point out I made a pair of fuzzy dice to hang on my windshield. I thought that would be funny. I went to the uh, auto store to get fuzzy dice, and they had these really weak-looking fuzzy dice that I knew would last probably four seconds in Antarctica. So I had to make my own out of uh, some material I bought. The spots are um, black fingernail polish because you can't glue something on. Glue, glue doesn't hold in Antarctica. And it's a uh, 550 parachute cord for the string, and it survived. So that was cool. Um, I drove about 400 miles during the field season on my snowmobile, and that's typical for ANSMET. You spend a lot of time on that machine, and if you don't have a snow machine, you can't work. This is the fuel for the snow machines. Uh, it comes in these big barrels full of fuel. They weigh about 350 pounds each, and you 
spend a lot of time wrestling fuel barrels. Um, this is the big sledge that we use called a comatic sledge. Um, to shift, when we shift camp, we have to shift all our cargo and we have to shift all our skidoo fuel, fuel for the season. We have a little hand crank pump that we use to refill the snow machines. There's another comatic sled with some of our other equipment. This is spares, uh, spare parts for stuff we use in camp. The things we use tend to be super simple and super rugged. You don't want fancy high-tech stuff because it gets out there in the cold and it stops working and then it's just dead weight and you're sorry you brought it. Um, we tend in Antarctica not to bring anything that we can't fix ourselves. The only exception to that would be our laptop computers and maybe an uh, MP3 player, stuff that you can live with if you don't have. Everything else is just dirt simple. And everybody who goes down there learns how to fix snowmobiles, by the way. I got, I got mad snowmobile carburetor skills my last trip. So we had a bunch of broken carburetors and I volunteered to help fix. These are a couple of those Nansen sleds that I talked about earlier. This uh, is how my tent mate and I kept our food supply up out of the drift. Uh, remember, you keep, keep stuff elevated above the surface and, it, and the snow doesn't drift around it so bad. And I have bought a little streamer to put up to uh, make the camp a little brighter. When all you see is white snow all day, it's nice to have a little color in your world. This is what we look like when we're shifting camp with all of our tents and food and fuel and everything loaded up on those sledges and eight snow machines getting ready to pull the sled, sledges around. This mountain, by the way, is called Mount Bumstead. The top of it is completely covered with uh, geodes, you know, uh, round rocks that are full of crystals inside. It was just absolutely amazing geology down there in the very few places where the geology sticks up above the ice. We found uh, fossilized ferns down there too. All right, um, to another question, what tools and resources might be useful to have if you were exploring Mars? And so we'll make this a quick one and we'll just see what kind of answers you have coming in, you know, thinking about Antarctica, thinking about Mars, what are you gonna need? And right away we have from Ms. Woodfin in the Wright School, air tanks, uh, also, uh, where did you get a geo from the mountain, oh, did I, I get guess? A, um, <laughs> actually, that, the day they went up to the top of the mountain was the day I was in camp fixing snow machines. So I didn't go, but my wonderful teammates brought me a geode from the top, so it was very nice of them. Um, air tanks on Mars, let's talk about that. If you had to bring all of the air you breathed to Mars, the tanks would be so heavy that you couldn't bring them from Earth. So we aren't gonna carry much air to Mars. We're gonna figure out how to make air on Mars. And well, then how about some of these, it sounds like some geologic tools and other tools like a pickaxe, sharp stuff, a mallet magnification device, yeah, digging equipment, um, storage or some type of vehicle for transportation, a jackhammer, I wonder go. if you even have any of those in Antarctica. Uh, probably. Uh, we think about an ax or dehydrated uh, food, garden hoe, water and tools to be able to garden, toothbrush to clean off the rocks let alone your teeth. There we go. Uh, an ax, We use shovel. the old ones for the rocks. Yeah, and they make a really good, my husband is a geologist, does that all the time yeah. as well, using a, a toothbrush. Good. Water filters, communication, transportation, a computer, storm detectors, flashlights, heat source, again, a jackhammer, and a vial, interesting, yep. to put the rocks and yeah, sand in. Yeah, that's a good in. point. You want to, if you're collecting scientific samples, you have to make sure they don't get contaminated while they're sitting around in camp and being transported back. We pay attention to that a lot in our field camp. I'll talk about that in a minute. And those are great connections. And those are definitely things that we're gonna want on Mars as well. Yeah, so there's a few others coming in, some repeats, including uh, a communication uh, device, and how about duct tape? Duct tape. So um, I have uh, two quick stories. When I was interviewing to be an astronaut, which took me seven years and three interviews, it took quite a bit of persistence to get hired. Um, my first interview, they uh, took all of us interviewees into the shuttle mission simulator uh, where they train the crews and they showed us this shuttle toolkit. You open up this drawer on the mid deck of the space shuttle and they opened up the top of a container and the first thing in there was four rolls of duct tape. I said, all right, I, these guys know what they're doing. Um, the other thing is duct tape in Antarctica does not work. It's like a piece of paper. You can stick it to something, it just falls right off. Because it's so cold, the glue doesn't stick. So, so much for the duct tape holding the styrofoam toilet thing in yeah, place that we wondered about. Nah, that just, that just sits on top of the box. I see. Um, now what we do have is freezer tape, which is designed to hold plastic bags of food closed in freezers. And 
that stuff sticks in Antarctica. So instead of duct tape, we use freezer tape for everything. Now, before you go on and back to uh, Antarctica here after this slide, just I know that a couple of you have mentioned you might have to close out as school might be ending for you. So if you do have to uh, depart from us, first of all, I want to thank you for joining us today. And I hope you realize how special it has been to be able to share this time with Stan Love today. He's extremely busy. You have no idea, right, Stan? <laughs> extremely busy. So we are so lucky to have his time with us. So if you do have to depart again, we totally understand. But those of you who can stay on the line, let's enjoy a little bit more of Stan and back to Antarctica. All right, here we go. So uh, we actually went to Antarctica to work. And here is what it looks like when you're working. Uh, so we've identified areas where this, there's this blue ice. And you can see in the picture here, it really is blue. It looks like the surface of somebody's backyard swimming pool that's been flash frozen. <laughs> still in place. Um, so we identify those from satellites, uh, and that's where we think it would be a good place to look for meteorites. Then um, usually each year, ANSMET sends down a main collection team to just pick up as many rocks as they can, and also a scouting team to look at new areas to see if there's meteorites there. So this was an area that scouting teams had been to before, and even collection teams had been there before and found lots and lots of meteorites. So we went there again because we knew it was a good place to look. We find a section of blue ice. We line up our snow machines, eight in a row, about 30 feet apart, and we drive up and we drive down and up and down, sweeping across the ice and keeping track of where we are with GPS so that we don't uh, miss areas or overlap. And we drive along at a couple of miles per hour looking for any rocks out on the ice. We also search for meteorites in moraine. A moraine is a line of rocks that's shaped by the flow of a glacier that's picking up rocks from its bed. There were some moraines where we were working, as you can see in the picture here. Um, these are these lines. And this is hard, hard work. There's a lot of rocks here, and you can see most of them are earth rocks. Um, and so you have to walk very slowly. You can't do this on a snow machine because you'd be going too fast. Also, the rocks are bad for the snow machine. And look at every single rock in the moraine, trying to look for one that might be from space. And here, lo and behold, we have found one. Here's a meteorite. It's this little tiny black dot right here. And that's typical size for a meteorite. And the way we tell it's a meteorite is if it looks black. Uh, meteorites get a blackened, melted coating on them as they come through the atmosphere at high speed. Of course, by the time they hit the ground, they've lost all their space speed. And they don't hit the ground any harder than they would if you drop them off of a tall building. So they're not going to make a crater if they're little. Craters only come from really big stuff, bigger than office buildings. <laughs> oh, drop my water. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's what happens when you gesture too much. <laughs> lid on the other one. It's a good thing I didn't hit the open one. All right. So when we find a meteorite, uh, everybody, the person who found it stands up on their snow machine, waves their arms, and then we come and collect it. Everybody converges on it, and we have somebody taking a picture of the meteorite in its environment. We're preparing a bag for the meteorite to go in. We are preparing a pair of sterile tongs to pick it up with. We are writing in the notebook where it is, what kind it is. We're preparing a marker flag to mark where we found it. We'll drill a hole in the ice and put that flag there like in a golf, like in a golf course. And then we got, of course, a couple people just standing around. Happens all the time. In any group effort, there's going to be a certain number of people who are standing around. So here we are picking up the meteorite with the sterile tongs and getting ready to put it in a clean plastic bag. Uh, we'll put the meteorite in the bag. We'll put a little metal tag with the number in it. We'll wrap it up with freezer tape so it stays wrapped up, and that's all we do with that sucker. What kind of meteorite is it? Uh, could it be from Mars? We don't care. We don't care. We want to get it in the bag. We want to get it stored, and then we want to get back on the road. We're going to send those meteorites back to the United States, and somebody in a nice, warm laboratory can figure out what kind of meteorite it is. We're not doing science. We're a collection team. And sometimes you find a big one. This was the first big meteorite we found uh, during the season, and it took us about 45 minutes to collect this one because everybody had to get their picture taken with the baby. Uh, this is actually an unusual type. It's called a carbonaceous chondrite. You can see this black crust here. That's the fusion crust that got on its way through the atmosphere. This is the natural color of the rock, and this is full of like, uh, like uh, almost like charcoal, powdered black, black carbon, uh, not a common type of meteorite. Most of them are rocky. 
So when we got all those meteorites in their bags with their little sample number tags, they go into these insulated boxes called, we call these isopods. And at the end of the season, this might have 300 pounds of meteorites in it. Uh, then these boxes go on the airplane, they get flown back to McMurdo, where they're there. then they're put in refrigerated storage to make sure they never get above freezing. They're shipped back to the United States the next year, still below freezing, to keep the, uh, the ice that's clinging to them from turning into water and making those changes in the chemistry of the rock that then, now I can't tell whether this rock got wet two weeks ago in shipping or two and a half billion years ago in the asteroid belt. Yeah, scientists don't like it when you uh, contaminate their samples that way. So we do all the work for bringing these things back, making sure they stay below freezing. And this year our delivery will occur in about, about March 21st, where we see them right here in this building. Yep, and they come back right here to Johnson Space Center. So you get to see the baby again if you work here. <laughs> um, during the course of our six weeks in the field, we do get two resupply flights. These are done by small twin-engine aircraft called a Twin Otter, a very famous airplane made in Canada that uh, helps sort of open the frontiers both in the Ant Arctic and Antarctic. Um, they bring us our mail, they bring all the stuff that we forgot in McMurdo and then asked to bring next time, you know, hey, my underwear didn't fit, can you bring me new underwear? Yeah, sure, but it's gonna be four weeks before you get it. And then they take away all the stuff we're not using anymore. And this is why we really admire the aircraft crews. Empty fuel barrels, empty food boxes, uh, empty propane cylinders, big gray buckets of poop. And that's not too bad right now, right? It's minus 20 degrees out here, so the poop is pretty solidly frozen. But once it gets into the warm cabin of the aircraft, it begins to warm up and it begins to emanate some smells. And the poor air crew has to put up with that for the three hour flight back to McMurdo. So we really admire them. And also big bags of garbage. Everything that we use in this field camp is coming back with us. We are not leaving anything out in the wild of Antarctica. All right, uh, another quick question, if you think we have the time. Sure, well, here's just a quick one anyway. And, and you know, you're thinking about whether it's Antarctica or going to Mars. And some of you might have said this already before, but in a word, one word, how might crew members feel if they explore the surface of another planet? And there's some thoughts for you there. Uh, to choose from, or you can come up with your own. I want to see some good words here. So we have excited, amazed, scared, mesmerized. I love that. All, All of the above. above. That's about right. <laughs> uh, sweaty. Um, Not a problem in Antarctica, by the way. And yeah, one of the groups was wondering, it's so sunny, how can it be so cold? Well, just is, okay? <laughs> you see the bright sun, but um, you are standing on an ice cap that's uh, the, the ice beneath your feet is 40 degrees below zero. The sun is low in the sky, and during the winter, it's 100 below zero. The sky is still clear. Actually, a cloudy sky holds heat better. In Antarctica, when you have a cloudy day, it's usually kind of warm. Interesting. But that cold, that, that clear sky doesn't hold any heat. Well, and, you know, back to this question, we got a lot of between scared, confused, curious, excited, overwhelmed, possibly lonely, amazed, thrilled. What might your word be? Uh, I like all those, actually. All of those? In, in fact, and, and I got to say this, um, it's, it's hard to get to be an astronaut. Astronaut selection is very difficult. Uh, this year, we're actually doing a selection cycle this year. We're probably going to hire 8 to 12 astronauts. We got 18 thousand applications. And getting through that is really a bear, but just about anyone can go to Antarctica. Feelings you get when you step off that plane in Antarctica are what I would expect to feel when I was exploring a, another planet. So it's a great way to um, get the sensation of what it would really be like to be a space explorer, only do it right here on Earth, and it's much, much easier than having to go through astronaut selection. So I recommend it highly. Um, but if you want to work in Antarctica, uh, I would recommend you study hard your math and science because most of the folks who go down there are scientists. And you know, three other words I'll just, that I just, that came in that are great are thrilled, exhilarated, speechless, and even perhaps a little paranoid. Uh, but I love the exhilarated. Yeah, paranoia is good with, when you direct it at your equipment because it's always going to try to find a new way to fail that you hadn't thought of and then you've got a problem. <laughs> awesome. All right, so we go on? Yes. All right, uh, Antarctica has beautiful scenery. We stopped here. This is a ridge of ice. Now, the place we were working at was called Larkman Nunatak. It's a little mountaintop that sticks up above the ice. 
and it's just the shape of a mountaintop, and it's not aerodynamically shaped. But the wind in Antarctica blows all the time, and it blows very hard, and it doesn't like things that are aerody not aerodynamically shaped, like shaped like the wing of an aircraft. So the wind over the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years has made this ridge to give Larkman Nunatak an aerodynamic shape. This ridge is about 200 feet high and two miles long, completely sculpted by the wind. Uh, near the top of the Nunatak, this is on the upwind side, these are house-sized blocks of hoarfrost, crystals of frost several inches long that condensed right out of the air and built these gigantic house-sized lumps up there. And this is the view from the top of the Nunatak looking down. Somewhere down here in that ice, uh, in the bright reflection of the sun on the ice is our field camp. Uh, medical situations are unfortunate in Antarctica. I don't have time to tell the story, but uh, if you get sick in field camp, it's a big deal. They have to send a plane to rescue you. Uh, that's why to go to Antarctica, you do have to go through some medical screening to make sure that you're not going to have a serious health problem. Um, our guy that we had to evacuate uh, had what could have been a very serious problem, and it took uh, five hours to get, in, to get an airplane to camp. It took another three hours to get him back to McMurdo, where they have the equivalent of a little walk-in clinic. And then it took a total of three days to get him to a proper hospital in Christchurch. So here we are getting ready to finish our field season, packing up our camp at the end of the season. And uh, we had the chance, uh, because of a problem with the aircraft that came to get us, to not just fly back to McMurdo, but go all the way to the South Pole. I'd been to the South Pole before on my previous trip, so I was like, oh, okay, South Pole. But my three crewmates who were with me, uh, it was their first trip to Antarctica, and they did not expect to get to go to the South Pole, but we got to go to the South Pole, so they were thrilled. So here we are taking off, moving away from Larkman Nunatak. Here's that long piece of wind sculpted ice that I talked about. Here we are at the South Pole Station, and they have a little tourist pole here with a little candy stripe pole. And the actual pole moves. The ice that, that the South Pole Station is built on flies about 30 feet a year. So every year they have to move the real pole marker upstream a little bit to be, have it be right on the exact geographic South Pole. Uh, they refueled our plane there. Uh, we had to get off while they refueled. They didn't want to have passengers on board while they're fueling the aircraft. So we waited for them to refuel. And then we flew back to McMurdo, where it was now late summer. Some of the sea ice was melted, and you can see the seawater here poking out through the ice. Um, if there are any people there who like scuba diving, the visibility under the ice in McMurdo is 1,000 feet. Typical visibility for good visibility for scuba diving might be 50 feet. Um, People like to talk about aliens with space exploration. We didn't see any aliens down in Antarctica, but we did see some of the locals. Here's one of those skuas I told you about. You can see he's figured out about uh, where, the, where the chow is. He's trying to figure out how to get into the food waste bin. We did see one penguin. This is with maximum magnification from one of my uh, teammates' cameras. This, this guy was out there about three miles away from us. And so uh, we had an up-close picture, but I don't think this is a real penguin. One of one of my teammates actually brought a penguin. And next to this shady character here, we have a wet elf seal. Uh, this is summer, so they're out there sunbathing. So at last we uh, return home. Our route goes from McMurdo Station back to Christchurch. We use the C-130 for that. This time it was a little uncomfortable because you have uh, everybody seated in there like I talked about. Last views of Antarctica, uh, Victoria land going up the coast. And then you land in Christchurch. And after two months in the barren uh, Antarctic, where you, there's not even anything to smell, just ice and rock, uh, the botanic gardens in Christchurch there at the height of summer are just absolutely awesome. You smell the flowers and see the grass. Uh, then it's commercial flight back to the United States. And that's all we need to talk about today. Thank you. Well, and first of all, I hope you all uh, really enjoyed that very dynamic, and you could almost hear the excitement as he's presenting the information and almost that little sense of 
sadness to leave? Is it almost sad to leave Ann Arbor? It is. I mean, by the, by the time, well, for getting out of field camp is a relief. Because <laughs> you get back to McMurdo and you're filthy, all you've had is sponge baths for the last several, you know, six weeks, and, and you're tired of eating your dishes by wiping them with a paper towel. And it's lovely to have somebody else cook your food. You can take a nice hot shower, but not too long because the robot said to conserve hot water. Um, so it's a, it's a relief to get out of field camp, definitely. But um, Antarctica is such an amazing place, and people who've been there talk about it the way astronauts talk about space. You know, it's just such an incredible experience, and I can't wait to get back. Awesome. Well, we so appreciate your time and sharing your story and this with us. And I think the students on the line have, um, have really enjoyed getting to learn all about ANSMET and Antarctica and thinking about the future of space exploration. Now, we do want to open it up for some questions. We've got about 16 minutes or so, and I have a couple of questions that have already come in. And if you have additional questions, please feel free to put them into the chat window. But one of the questions that came in earlier from Oxier Elementary in Scottsdale, Arizona, they wanted to know who inspired you to be an astronaut and a scientist? Uh, well, let's see. Um... To be a scientist, well, my mom's a scientist, she's a botanist. Um, and I'd always admired uh, the amazing things that science has given us as, as human beings, you know, freedom from want in many parts of the world, uh, better food, uh, better medical care. Um, plus, I just thought science was cool. And I've always been interested in exploring, too. I grew up in Oregon, and there was a patch of woods near my house, and I loved to go exploring there. So I always loved to do that. Um, I didn't start realizing that it was possible to actually be an astronaut, that it wasn't just something in movies and books, um, until I was in college. So I was in college studying physics so that I could be a scientist. And we had a graduate of my college uh, come back from uh, NASA. He'd been an astronaut. He'd been to space. He came back and gave a presentation at my school and said, um, frankly, everybody here, the place is called Harvey Mudd College. It's a little science and engineering school in California that everybody in here in this school is qualified to be an astronaut, you should sign up. So I tried and was very fortunate to get through the selection process, and here I am. Awesome. So think about those in your life that might influence you to be what you, who knows, might want to be, and maybe Stan has inspired some of you to want to become an astronaut or a scientist. I bet you might have. <laughs> <laughs> so here's another question. Uh, this one comes from, uh, Let's see, from the Rice School, and they were wondering, you showed that lake of water yes. and how clear it is. Are there fish in that lake? Uh, so that was the ocean, actually. Ah. Um, and yes, there's oodles of fish down there. Some of them actually have an antifreeze chemical in their blood, so that even though the seawater is 28 degrees Fahrenheit, four degrees below freezing, it doesn't freeze because it's got salt in it. But the fish don't freeze because they have antifreeze in their blood. So there's lots of sea life down there underneath that ice. So even in the cold of winter when up, up above, there's, there's just no chance for anything living to be. Um, down under the ice, there's this amazing ecosystem with crabs and shrimp and starfish and sea urchins and sea anemones and fish. Would you ever go diving in there? Uh, I'm not much of a diver, but I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question from Cedar Ridge High School, and they're wondering, what were the most dramatic temperatures you experienced when you were in Antarctica? Um, so the coldest we got with wind chill was about minus 40. The air temperature without wind is about minus 17 Fahrenheit. Um, you don't have to say Fahrenheit or Celsius when you say minus 40, by the way, because minus 40 C is minus 40 Fahrenheit. Um, so about minus 17 or so Fahrenheit uh, air temperature. Um, on my first trip in McMurdo when we were training to go out in the field, it got up to plus 40 Fahrenheit, 8 degrees above freezing. And we were all just roasting because we were out in the field for our training. We had the warm tent and the warm stove and the warm clothes, and we we're like, yeah, open up the tent, take off a layer. Ah, I'm just sweating like mad. So plus 40 to minus 40 is what we saw in Antarctica. Uh, minus 100 is quite common out on the on the polar ice cap in the winter. It is not pretty. Yeah, so, sounds kind of brutal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now here's a, a question. Um, from Oxier Elementary, and they're wondering, do you have another astronaut that you have looked at and admired for what they've done as an astronaut? Oh, uh, shoot, most of them. <laughs> uh, there's a lot. Working in the astronaut office, you are surrounded by just jaw-droppingly amazing people. You 
they are all just incredible. Um, and even even if you know maybe my flight we did stuff that I thought was more interesting than what they did on their flight. That, that other person is a is a jet pilot or uh, helped deliver a baby rhinoceros at a zoo. Or they, you know they all have just amazing portfolios. Um, so one that really inspired me was that uh, former graduate of my college. His name is Pinky Nelson. Um, so I tried to follow in his footsteps. Um, I have great admiration for our first uh, female shuttle commanders, uh, the first women to command space missions. Came right here from Johnson Space Center during the time that I was here. Um, but really, everybody I work with is just amazing. When you, if you apply to be an astronaut and come in for the interviews, uh, your main feeling is going to be just just amazement that you're qualified to be in the group of people that you're in because they're also amazing. So that tells you a little bit about how amazing you guys uh, are in the presence of someone who really is amazing, and it is. Ah, and you know, just lucky. Yeah, but that that and that, you know, when you're around amazing people, it makes you want to be that much more amazing as well. So. Keep yourselves around good people, good role models, and strive to do always good things because goodness breeds goodness, I think. Um, here's a question from Evergreen Middle School, and they're wondering about these sterile tongs that you mentioned. Why do you need to pick up these meteorites with sterile tongs? Well, because when the meteorites go back to the laboratory, one of the things that scientists are looking for in them is the chemical building blocks that life arose from on Earth. Those chemicals are common in space. Um, we think those chemicals were present on Mars, and maybe life arose on Mars from the same kind of chemistry. But now imagine how that scientist's uh, results are going to come out if, in fact, the meteorite that he's studying got snot on it from Antarctica because somebody's nose dripped on the tongs. Oh, dang. He's going to say, whoa, it's not in space. And he's going to get a whole lot of really wrong answers. So we want those tongs to be as clean as we possibly can. And, and I'm not joking about the snot, by the way. Your nose runs a lot down there because it's so cold. And occasionally, if you look through our field notes, you will see, you know, this meteorite accidentally got a snot drop on it. So we're not going to, we're going to make sure that that one doesn't get sent to that particular scientist for that particular study because you just can't keep everything perfectly clean. And the tongs start the season sterile. But by the time we get to the end of the season, they're probably not completely sterile. We do our best, but it's harsh conditions and uh, uh, accidents happen. And you know, it brings up the point of, as you think about future planetary exploration and collecting samples, the whole idea of making sure we are collecting samples that are from that particular environment and not contaminated with our own human germs is so important. And our curation staff within here, the NASA Astro Materials Research and Exploration Science Division we really specialize in trying to make sure we provide the tools so that the crew can pick up samples in Antarctica. When we go to space, samples can be collected um, in the correct type of manner as well. So it's a very important aspect yeah. to think about. So that was a great question. It would, everybody. it would be awful if we went to Mars and discovered life and then found out 20 years later that we had brought it with us. Exactly. That would be a shame. Uh, here's a question from, uh, speaking of planets like Mars and Earth, and what's your favorite planet? Oh, Earth. Earth. Why? Uh, it has more interesting things going on on it. <laughs> so the other planet, and, and this is a strong statement coming from an astronomer, but really the Earth is the most interesting thing in space. Um, I didn't get a real sense for that until I flew in space on the space shuttle. And there's a chance to look down at the amazing, gorgeous Earth. It's colorful. It changes. The clouds move. The Seasons change. The you know the snow moves north and south with the seasons. The, the trees leave out, um, and but there's a chance to see that amazing dynamic planet, and then just look over there and see the moon uh, under the same sort of lighting conditions. Although the moon looks brilliant and beautiful from the Earth at night, if you're up in orbit and can compare Earth and Moon, the Moon looks little and dirty and boring. Uh, there's just no comparison. And the other planets, uh, you know, some are huge, some are smaller. They're, they're alien places to us. But nowhere else in the solar system has the amazing variety that the Earth does. And most of the amazing thing, the most amazing thing on Earth, of course, is life. We haven't found it anywhere else in the universe. We're looking hard. We still haven't found it. But that phenomenon, to me, makes Earth the most interesting planet there is. 
Excellent. Can't forget our home. So here's a question from Cedar Ridge High School. Also, the surfing everywhere else is terrible. <laughs> hey, maybe Europa. Uh, it'd be a little cold. No, uh, I remember it's under, it's yeah, under, it's under uh, 20 miles of ice. Exactly. That's so. not good surfing. <laughs> so here's a, a sock question from Cedar Ridge uh -oh, High School. Uh-oh, I, I talk too much about socks. All On right. a scale of 1 to 10 to old cheese, how bad do socks smell after a trip to Antarctica? Okay, so... Um, my socks, so I was religious about hanging my socks up every night. And I had two pair of socks, one that I would wear in the boots out, out for work, and then one that I would wear in the tent. Uh, I dried them out every night, and I switched, I switched to new socks halfway through the season, not because they smelled bad, just because I could. Because I was halfway through the season, I had four pairs of socks, and, and I used up two pairs. So my socks never smelled bad, honest, honest God. <laughs> they were okay, but um, if you are not careful about your socks, they are going to get pretty horrible. And that's not an experiment we want you to do at home. Don't wear yeah. the same pair yeah. of socks in the ice cold and, and then keep them, uh, yeah, change out the well, socks. Well, if you, you throw them in the dryer every night, it might, uh, well, I don't know. I don't <laughs> want to encourage that kind of bad behavior. That's right. Well, you know, Rice School has asked a couple of times about shadows, and they're wondering, you know, if it's daylight all 24 hours, what are the shadows like? Do they change, or can you can even go back to a yeah. slide if you need to? Let's see if we can find a picture with a good shadow in it. Actually, why don't we do this? We'll look at uh, Dr. Catherine Joy, by the way. This is Dr. Catherine Joy in this picture. She worked here in this building for a couple of years, but she's now back in uh, Manchester, I believe. So if Dr. Joy in her penguin suit stayed here for 24 hours, you would see her shadow swing around all the way around in a circle and come back. And her shadow would always be much longer than she is tall because the sun angle is so low. So shadows just crank around in a full circle every 24 hours. That's, and that's a great question um, from uh, Rice School because that is, as you look at the shadows and you can determine the heights of things, it certainly, or the how tall something is, it's, it's really an interesting question, something I wouldn't have thought about. So well, Here's an interesting story. On my first trip to Antarctica, we'd been out in field camp for five weeks. And, of course, we are keeping on the clock as we would, uh, you know, in a normal work day. And we're keeping New Zealand time because that's what the continent uses for convenience. And so we got used to always being out and about and doing our work when the sun angle was in a certain range because it was that time of day. Well, one time late in the season, we had a great big party. And uh, for various circumstances, I found that I had to get up and go out of the tent to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. And this is a great big production because you have to get all that clothes on before you can go outside and, and go to the potty tent. Um, so I uh, got out of my bed, I put on all my heavy clothes, and I went outside the tent, and the sun was in a place I had never seen it. And it was just from that, even though the scenery was just the same, it was all lit up just the same, it was as disorienting as going outside at night in a place that you've only seen in the daytime. It was really freaky. Even though the lighting, the sun was still there, it was just as bright. Because it was coming from a different direction, it was amazingly disorienting. And I can, I can imagine that could happen in space and space exploration as yeah. well, just from that, hold on a second, let me, let me gain control of where I am and what I'm looking at, that perspective. Uh, here's a question, you know, related to sort of the environment there in, in Antarctica. Is it at all more difficult to breathe? Uh, the air is super cold. And if you're breathing hard, you can, it can make your throat and lungs feel kind of cold. But it's not hard to breathe. Um, it's the same composition as we have here on Earth. Now, where we were working up at Larkman Nunatak, we were 8,500 feet above sea level. So when you first go up there, the air feels kind of thin, and when you're especially toting all that cargo around and setting up 80-pound tents, you can get pretty winded. Um, the South Pole is like being 11,000 feet above sea level. The actual elevation is only 9,400 feet, um, and I don't want to trouble you guys with the atmospheric scale height and temperature dependence thereof. but. Uh, you are kind of gasping for breath if you suddenly go from sea level up to South Pole and start shifting cargo. 
Yeah, and running out of breath is not a, never a good thing. No, no matter well, what. it's self-limiting, right? Yeah. You know, you will you will stop working one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> Just hope it's not because you fainted. Really. So here's a, a little bit of a, a more, you know, kind of personal type of question, but what do you like to do in your free time? Free time? <laughs> free, well, we have to okay. maybe explain so, what free time um, is. <laughs> so uh, in my copious spare time, that's sarcastic, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm told you're not supposed to be sarcastic with young audiences. Sorry. I don't have a lot of free time because I'm very busy. Um, but I write science fiction stories, and I'm trying to get them published. Um, I practice and teach Taekwondo, which is a martial art. Um, I do volunteer work at the Nature Center down the road from me. Um, they're trying to restore some um, Texas coastal prairie that has been ravaged pretty bad by development, and they're trying to bring it back to its original condition. Um, I'm a big anime fan, so I watch some anime. Uh, and that ought to keep me pretty busy, I think. I think that sounds like it keeps you pretty busy. Um, and here's, I guess we'll, we'll maybe call this the last question since we're just about at the top of the hour. But, you know, all this Anne's Meta talk about searching for meteorites, what questions do meteorites actually help us answer? Why are they so oh, important to go out question. to collect? All right, sure. So um, we are, the, the scientific community wants to answer questions like, where do we come from? Very basic questions. Um, and it's a complicated answer, and we only have little bits of it here, but we're always working on it. And one of the one of the parts of that question is, where did the sun come from? Where did the planets come from? These things are with us all our lives and have been around for billions of years. Um, to understand where the Earth and planets came from, we need to find materials that haven't changed much since the sun was born and since the solar system was born. Now, rocks on Earth have a terrible life. They get eroded by water. They get ground to dust, they get blown around, they end up on the seafloor, they end up in uh, tectonic plates that get subducted down in the mantle, remelted, squirted out of volcanoes. And if you want to find materials on Earth that came from the earliest history of the solar system, you are out of luck. There are no really old rocks on Earth. The oldest we get, the oldest rocks on Earth are still a billion years after the solar system formed. But meteorites, most of them, come from the asteroid belt, from tiny little worlds that formed early on in the history of the solar system, cooled off quickly, never had oceans, never had wind, never had volcanoes, and are basically unchanged since the earliest days of the solar system. Those materials, by studying them carefully, we can figure out what made the Earth, what made the sun, what were those materials, where did they come from? Previous generations of stars or gas floating in between the, uh, floating around in the galaxy. Those materials tell us the origin of our planet, of our solar system, and ultimately of ourselves. And so that history and evolution of our, of our solar system and us is really locked up in those rocks. Yep, and that's what we're mostly learning about when we, uh, when we study meteorites. That's why they're so valuable to the scientific community, and that's what makes ANSMET such a good thing for the, the science community. We bring back the treasure every year that allows scientists all over the world, not just the United States, to unlock the secrets of our past. Awesome. Well, with that, I think that's a great question to end on. It is uh, the top of the hour here. And again, for those of you that were able to stay on the line with us for the entire time, thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, but most of all, I'd really like to thank uh, Stan Love for sharing, again, his expertise, his excitement, his knowledge, his passion, and all of the great things that are able to be done with ANSMET exploring um, our Earth, as well as thinking about other planets. So Stan, thank you so much for taking this time. You're and very welcome. Thanks to you for listening, and study your math and science. You might get to go to Antarctica or even to space someday. Sounds great. You heard it from Stan himself. So with that, we'll sign off. Thank you, everyone, again for joining us. And until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye, everyone.